Welcome to Bethany Online. We're glad that you can be with us here today. This is for the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, but regardless of what day or time you're watching, we're glad that you can worship with us, and we will be worshiping all together. We begin with the invocation as we ask God to be present with us, for we know where two or more are gathered, there God is with us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. for today comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, the 21st chapter, beginning at the 23rd verse. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? 
Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. This is the word of the Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace is yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is the Gospel set from St. Matthew, uh, the 21st chapter. I want to reread just a small part of that to you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. My dear friends, I'm doing my best. Have you ever said that? I'm going to assume that most, if not all of you, have said that at some point in your life. I know I've said it in my life. I know that I used to say it more with my lips when I was younger. I would say it to people. And now I probably say it more internally. It's something that's, that's more of a, a thought process for me. And to be honest, when I think about it, I say it usually in two different circumstances. The first is when I'm really not doing my best. When I'm working at something but not working as hard as I could. When I'm thinking about something but I haven't really come up with the answers. And usually there's someone, maybe there's me, pressing myself to say, why aren't you getting this done? Why haven't you finished this? What's your problem? And so an easy response is I'm doing my best. You can't ask for more than my best, even though I'm not getting it done. And there's a certain amount of guilt that's there because I know that I could do something differently. I know I could do more, but I'm saying I'm doing my best. The other time is equally difficult because it's times when I'm doing the most I can, I'm doing the best I can, and I'm still coming up short. I'm sure you've had those times too. You run out of time. You think you're getting everything done and there's just not enough time in the day. Or you think you can understand something and you're having a struggle understanding it. Or you think that you can accomplish something and it just doesn't happen. And you say, I'm doing my best, but I'm still failing. And there's a sense of frustration there. And frustration and guilt are two things that really don't work well in our lives. Still we say, I'm doing my best. Jesus is speaking to chief priests and the elders. Let's go back to that first line that's really important here. It says, when Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching. Jesus walks in the temple. He walks into the temple and he finds the chief priests and the elders there. But long before he finds them, he sits down and he starts to teach and the crowds come. And the crowds are listening to him. And that's where there's a problem, and we have a tendency not to recognize it real well, recognize what the problem is. See, the chief priests and the elders are the people who are supposed to be listened to in the temple. The crowd should be coming to them from their point of view. They are the leaders. They are the ones who've been educated. We have this tendency, this tendency to believe that they're really not that sharp or they really don't have the right faith. And part of that comes from the fact that they did reject John the Baptist. They rejected what he had to say. They did not believe. They did not go out and be baptized. They did not believe the kingdom of heaven was coming. And they had continued that path by rejecting Jesus, who was the kingdom of heaven coming. He was in their midst, and they weren't listening. Part of that had to do with the fact that they believed that they were the ones. They were the ones who had been educated, they were the ones following God. They were the ones in charge of the temple. Therefore, everyone should listen to them. And so they're not happy about Jesus being there. And it's not a problem of them being uneducated or, or stupid. It's not about them having a lack of faith. It's a, it's a point that they are misguided. And Jesus is about to show them that they're misguided. 
They know better, by the way, than to walk into a trap. He asks them a question that really puts them in a tough position. He says to them, where did John's baptism come from? By whose authority did he have that? And you answer this question, and then I'll answer yours. Well, there's a problem. If they say that John's baptism came from heaven, then he's going to say, well, why didn't you follow him? Why didn't you believe? Don't you see that he said the kingdom of heaven is near and I'm here? On the other hand, if they say that his authority was of human origin, that he was just another man, the people, the crowds who come to listen to Jesus are going to become very angry. They're barely listening to the chief priests and the elders right now. Will they listen at all? If this one that they believe is a prophet is denied by the ones who are sitting there. And so the chief priests and the elders say this, we, we do not know. And Jesus says, well, then I'm not going to answer your question. But he launches into this story, a story that's to help them see how misguided they are. Jesus is trying to show them that he is the Messiah. He's trying to show them their failings so they will see that they need a Messiah. So he talks about these two sons. Two sons, and neither one either does what they say or accomplishes what, or says the right thing, one or the other. So first you've got this, this son. You've got the first son who he goes to. He says, son, go work in the vineyards today. He says, I will not. But later he changed his mind and he went. And then there's his second son who says, no, I'm not going, dad. But then goes and does it. So... Who did the right thing? First one says, I will not, and then he goes and does it. The first, second one says, I'll go. But he never goes. And so if you're focused on what people do, then there's an easy answer. Jesus says, which one of them did the right thing? Which one of them obeyed the Father? Which one of them did what the Father wanted? Chief priests, the elders don't see this trap coming. They think there's an answer. They should have seen it coming because the last time Jesus asked a question, there wasn't a good answer. But this time, they jump in. The first. The one who said he wouldn't do it, but then went and did it. We all make mistakes, but we went and did the right thing. It's about what we do, not what we say. We get caught up in that as well. The truth of the matter is that neither one of the sons does what the father asks. See, the father asks them to be loyal and to be obedient, to answer truthfully. And the first son answers that he will not go, but then feels guilty because he's not doing his best and goes back and does it. The second son tries to say, I'm doing my best, but then doesn't go and do it, and fails. And maybe is frustrated by that. Neither one of them has done what the Father has asked. And so Jesus puts this question out there, and immediately the chief priests and the elders see it as, what do we have to do? What are we going to do to have the kingdom of heaven? That's part of a system, the sacrificial system, where it had become all about what you do. They'd lost sight of the sacrifice as giving back to God. They'd lost sight of the fact that God was the one who was blessing them through the sacrifice, was taking away their sins, and the whole sacrificial system was leading to the kingdom of heaven coming so that that one sacrifice, God's one and only Son, would come and take away the sins of the world for all time, for all people, and forever. That's what they lose sight of. They are misguided. So then Jesus says something that gets us really uncomfortable, at least it makes me uncomfortable. Jesus says to them, he says, John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw that they did, saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. In other words, you should have noticed that the tax collectors and the prostitutes were believing John, and that should have changed your heart. Wow, that's, you know, th this, this is hard stuff. Until we think about it for a little bit. 
think about the fact that the tax collectors and the prostitutes understand and believe in forgiveness from John and from Jesus, believe that they need that forgiveness from John and ultimately from Jesus. The tax collectors could not avoid their status among others. They could not avoid the fact that they were looked down upon, that they were ostracized, they were isolated, that the tax collectors were people who were not only not important but weren't liked in their community. Whether they were doing what was faithful for the Roman government, government or whether they were taking too much didn't matter. They were despised. They were not good people in the eyes of the people who were trying to be good people. And so the tax collectors, hearing Jesus' message of salvation and forgiveness, turned to him. And specifically, we have stories of one, some who turn completely to Jesus. And then there are the prostitutes. The prostitutes are also people who cannot avoid their status in life. They are who they are, they're doing what they do, and they are considered outcasts, people who can be punished by the church. And they may not have a good way to get out of their life, their condition of life. Many of the people who were prostitutes at the time of Jesus were people who had no way of earning an income. The only things that they had left to themselves, left in life, were begging or prostitution, neither one of which was going to make them seem like an upstanding person in the community. They understood their brokenness. They understood how much they were failing. They could say they were doing their best, but they weren't getting accomplished what they wanted. And John comes and preaches a message of salvation and forgiveness. Jesus comes and preaches that same message of repentance and forgiveness, God's grace and love coming into their lives. And they recognized their need, and they saw their need for a Savior, and they turned. And Jesus is saying, they may have done what was wrong, but in the end they turned. You think you're doing what is right, but you aren't seeing God. None of us are doing what is right what the Father wants. All of us need a Savior. So recognizing that we are stuck in life, recognizing that we are broken, recognizing that we make mistakes, recognizing that we feel guilt sometimes and frustration sometimes and want to scream out, I'm doing my best, but it's really not. That's what the law shows us, our stuckness. And it also shows us one other thing. The law shows us that we need Jesus. The law shows us that we need Jesus, who is the gospel, that good news. The law is there to point us to Jesus, and Jesus is there to take away our sins and to remove that burden of the law, to remove that pain and that suffering, that struggle, because Jesus took all of it to the cross for us. There are no good sons in the world. There are no good daughters. There are no good people in the creation because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's only a good Savior. A good Savior who loves us. A good Savior who died for us. A good Savior who takes away the sin of the world. It is Jesus. In his name. Amen. Separate 
compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. Veil tore before you, silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our Heavenly Father, we want to believe that we're doing our best. We want to believe that somehow we can succeed, that somehow we can be smart enough, work hard enough, be faithful enough to do all the things that we're supposed to do. And yet, we find ourselves sometimes feeling guilty because we didn't do what we thought we should, sometimes feeling frustrated because it just doesn't work out, sometimes being angry at ourselves or the world to dominate, people seem to be harmed more than they seem to be helped. So we pray that you would remind us that your son Jesus came and saw us in our state, saw us as helpless and harassed, saw us as needing a savior, and spoke to us. Spoke to us through the prophets of old, spoke to us through John the Baptist, spoke to us himself and said, I am the way and the truth and the life who brought us understand that you sent your one and only son to die for us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to bring that message of salvation, that good news to people who desperately need to know it. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would be with us in all of our struggles. That you would help us to share that message. We pray, O oh Lord, for all people in whatever they're calling, and we ask, O oh Lord, that you would help them to avail themselves of your wisdom a wisdom that comes from knowing your grace abounds and your love and mercy is what takes away our pain and hardship. And so we pray for our leaders of church and state, our leaders of industry, our leaders of our homes, our leaders of all kinds of things and the things that we ourselves do. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who are sick and in need of your healing touch. We pray especially for those we name in our hearts. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless them, that you would hold them in your healing hands. We know that you are the great physician of body and soul, and we pray, O oh Lord, for those who are having any kind of spiritual, emotional, or physical struggle. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bring your healing to them. We pray, O oh Lord, for all of these, your servants. We ask, O oh Lord, also that you would be with us in our celebrations. That you would bless us, that you would bless us in our times of celebration, whether they are birthdays, or anniversaries, whether they are weddings or they are baptisms, you would be there with us and help us to see your presence and to, and to bask in the joy that you give to us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would also walk with us in the things that we are doing, 
and that you would help us to fill your joy and your peace, even when the world around us seems to be something other than joy-filled and other than peaceful. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us. Help us to be a reflection of your light and your love. And help us to remember that you were the one. You sent your son, the one, Jesus, to be our way and our truth. And we pray in his name the prayer which he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.